Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Monday, May 23rd. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris on this episode. We'll talk about in-season management, specifically valuing players if you're trying to make trades or trying to make some decisions about ads and drops even. I think the same principles would hold up here, but it's trade season. Everyone has the itch. I'm in a few leagues where a handful of trades happened in 48 hours over the weekend because the teams going for it and keeper leagues especially are trying to get as much value as they can as soon as they possibly can. The teams that have been in the bottom of the standings have accepted their fate for this season, but we're seeing it in redraft leagues too, where people are pulling back, looking at the strengths and flaws of their roster and trying to achieve a little more balance because we've played about 40 games now, I think for every single team. So about a quarter of the season is in the books. Therefore people feel more confident in their current trajectory so we'll talk about that uh, we're going to talk about Tommy Edmond maybe being a little more like Ozzy Albies than we once thought interesting email that came in uh, a follow-up email about Joey Votto that brought something to light that I had not even realized before so I'm looking forward to talking about that in a little while we had a question about summer home run rates too which I think is right in your wheelhouse as our resident ball expert so looking forward to digging into that among other things uh, how was your weekend you know uh, we, uh, we had a nice, uh, close COVID exposure in the house. So we were actually at a pool party when we found out that, um, uh, somebody who'd been in our house the night before had just tested positive. So yeah, we're like, Hey, bye, bye everybody. Uh, so far we've been testing negative, but also that person <laughs> dropped off, uh, a dog that I think needs a CPAP machine. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I've heard a dog make noises like this at night. So I'm just, I'm exhausted. And of course, when you're exhausted and testing, you're like, oh, is this, is this COVID tired? Right. Yeah. You're tired or stupid snoring dog tired. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think when you're on watch for any sort of symptoms like that, you, you oh, sit there and you're like, oh, I, I woke up and my throat was dry. Was it dry or was it sore? <laughs> So you drink a gallon of water and you're like, is no, peeing a lot so of much. symptoms? Yeah. <laughs> My stomach doesn't feel good. <laughs> Why do I feel bad? I feel weird now. It's like, just, it's so I hard. I think allergies, allergies is so hard. Cause I think one thing that we could just do is like, oh yeah, if you've got anything going on, then like, you know, any symptoms and stay home. Like, well, let's, let's have robust healthcare and, and stay at home policies. And then you're like, but allergies. <laughs> I felt that last week when I was at home in Wisconsin, the tree pollen was off the charts high. So the day after I got there, my nose was itchy and my nose started running and I'm sitting there. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, like <laughs> I I'm fine. I'm totally fine. Nose then added, the whole time I'm a hypochondriac, right? Even better. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm, like, dying. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure that I'm, I'm not doing dumb things. So I, I'm yeah. sitting there, I'm like, this, this is pure allergies. This is the itch that I've had my entire life living out, living in Wisconsin. I remember this spring allergies. This is familiar. <laughs> I'm gonna be fine. Came back to California, was here for about a day. The itch was gone after one day. <laughs> Different stuff blooming here that I'm apparently not allergic to. So no, there you go. There's time. your. There's your allergy talk. Yeah, I'll develop the allergies. So I'm <laughs> looking forward to that. Uh, but yeah, stay safe out there. Obviously, a lot of stuff going on. Just do what you can to keep everybody around you safe. The interesting thing that we're looking at right now, NFBC ADP and multiple full sets of projections to look at, we don't have as much of a common ground. And I think the other thing that makes it more challenging now to find values that make sense to everybody is that the needs are so different. Like if you start looking at trades and trying to work out a deal with someone, the positional balance has to be achieved. And then within that, you still have to come up with a combination of players or even a one-for-one -one swap where both sides feel like they're getting something equal. Um, and just to draw on some, some recent experience, the aforementioned NL Labor Disaster Squad that I built, I was trying to make a trade coming out of the weekend it's full of guys that are currently by in-season projection supposed to still be decent players. Trent Grisham, I think by the bat in an NL only league is supposed to be a 10 or $11 player the rest of the season. Good luck trading him for someone who's playing well and is expected to return similar value the rest of the season, right? There's all these little wrinkles about 
well, he's underperforming right now. Are the projections wrong? And I think those are the right kinds of questions that you need to, to ask with underperforming players. And it's part of why you have to sometimes accept getting 50 cents on the dollar. That might be an example of where a six or seven dollar player is the best that you're going to get back in a trade because the one somewhat common evaluation tool we have, the rest of season projection, you know, through the fan graphs auction calculator, that might be the closest thing to the Beckett that we actually have for fantasy trades and for pickups this time of year. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, it's a good place to start. I mean, you can always have your disagreements with it, but at least you'll know whether it's within a dollar or two. I don't tend to try to be absolutist about it and just be like, this is the number. Therefore I will not trade with you. Um, especially with uh, players that are you know doing something differently or young or, you know, uh, may not be captured by it, but um, you know, and, and then there's, I guess there's also, uh, you know, it's a little bit of foibles with like relievers where it's like, oh, this says that your reliever that you're giving me is worth like a dollar over the rest of the season. And my Brian Reynolds is worth twelve dollars. I won't do that trade. I don't know if you need saves. Uh, it doesn't matter as much uh, what the auction calculator says if that's a, an urgent need for you and you believe that the player you're getting back is going to give you saves more than the auction calculator does. So there are fringe cases where it's not that useful, but I think. Uh, for the most part, uh, I want to know what it says, you know? Yeah, it's just a good starting point at the very least. And within a few dollars in either direction, you could still come up with something that works. I do think the standings gained point uh, points uh, concept is really important when you're thinking about moves you would make and when you would stray from those values. I think uh, if you look at stolen bases in most leagues, look at wins in most leagues, saves in most leagues, usually they're pretty well clustered steals are probably even more valuable now than they are on draft day. There's already a, a tax, a premium that you're paying for guys that run in February and in March. And I think the price goes up even higher when you start to deal for those players in May and June, uh, unless you're dealing with someone who maybe knows they're not going to win the category and, and the whole room knows it. So then they can't command that premium, but there should be enough willing buyers where they can get something really good in the return. But that's part of how I came to a conclusion like I don't know, two weeks ago and I made a move for Starling Marte in a league. And part of my calculation was that the points he could give me in steals, average runs, and RBIs, looking at him versus the player, that my last outfielder that was currently in my lineup, it was a huge jump. And I know it's not a perfect way to calculate how much of an impact there's going to be. But if you see a 30 point difference in projected average, you see 30 more runs and 20 more RBIs and 15 more steals. You can kind of look and see how much would that change my fate in each category. And I saw a player that was probably worth 15 plus standings points relative to what I was using because the league was so deep. So I do think that's probably the, the main thing I would use as I'm starting to hone in on which players to trade for is just seeing how I can make up the most ground with, the, the most impactful sort of move. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I think it's time for that is for, for sure. Um, it's just, uh, it's hard. It's hard sometimes to like, you have to also judge what other people will, will be trying to do. Right. And so you can be like, Oh, it's obvious. I can make a lot of ground up in case that's where I, f I stand in a couple of places because I, Maybe Tyler Wells is up too much or Drew Rasmus is up too much, but like I could use case. Well, the problem is I'm going for two starters like everybody else, you know, and they're going to be doing two starters. And so it is, it may look like it's the easiest place, but we're all acting the same way. Um, I don't have an answer for that, by the way. It's just, it's something that I've noticed as I've been chasing K's. I'm like, oh man, I can see which teams are also getting, like if I have three two stars I'm looking at and I get one, I can see which other teams got the other two. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the downside to the chasing the two start pitchers aside from everyone else wanting those guys. They're not as good, right? They're not as good. So you can get the, <laughs> the boost in two categories, but you can drop in the other two categories. So that's where I think your current placement I've mentioned before being near the bottom in ratios. I think now is a time where you can start to be more aggressive with volume. You're already that low. It's going to take some things going right for you to get out of that hole and be really competitive in the category. You've got a better chance of getting lucky with volume than you do just kind of grinding it out with the core that you have. 
So I, I think that's that's a more common problem. I think the the other challenging thing about the standings this early, this is a question that came in from Isaac, and I think you might be in this situation in at least one of your leagues right now, is when do you start protecting your ratios? At what point in the season do you significantly alter the pitchers that you would or would not use because you're doing really well in ERA and whip and you don't want to lose the top standing spot that you have in one or both of those categories. Yeah, I guess uh, I'm in first place in our uh, Brit league. Uh, and I, the only person who has a better ERA and whip is you in second place. Um, so I can only gain, uh, you know, two points by chasing you. Uh, and yet uh, I've got a two, eight, five ERA in this 10 team league. Uh, and the next best team has a 308 or a 306. So I've got a lot of more I can do in the other direction in terms of uh, my ERA can drop, you know, 0.2, you know, points before I'm really in trouble, um, you know, of losing even one point in ERA. And so I'm definitely in the position where, you know, I can see that coming. I'm, I have a ton of people in front of me in terms of K's. Um, it's 20 K's, but they still have that 0. 0.2 cushion. So I'm going after I'm, I'm streaming in this league. I have a, a, a spot at the bottom where I just pick up pitchers that I like that are pitching in the next couple of days. It's not uh, a weekly lineup. So I'm just sort of, you know, filtering, you know, picking, picking matchups I like. And because it's a 10 team league, there's a lot of guys out there. So I'm hoping uh, to, to gain some ground in K's there and, and, uh, and not lose much in terms of ERA and whip. Yeah, and I think if you are currently winning in the ratios categories and you get to these two start weeks that generally are, are coveted, but you've got lower end skills players, kind of your fringy on the roster, off the roster, or at least in and out of your lineup sorts of guys, and they're catching the Dodgers, the Yankees, you know, the Astros, some of the top lineups in the league, at least for one of those two turns, it is tempting to sit them down. A lot of it comes down to you know, who is your alternative. And uh, like right now, I'm not throwing low-end starters against the Dodgers, especially. I'm avoiding that at all costs. I think Merrill Kelly was a good example of someone who just got rocked recently by them. But they put up more than five runs a game. He, you think he gets them back again? <laughs> gets them again this week, too. So it, yeah, Merrill Kelly, for that one. <laughs> the Merrill Kelly correction fortnight is in full swing right now. All that is to say you may have to just absorb some of those guys because you might not have someone on your bench that you can use instead. So I don't think it's going to ruin your season if you start you know, one guy in a two-start week where he's got a bad matchup like that and you're currently winning ERA and whip. But if you keep chasing volume with that lead in pursuit of maximizing wins and Ks and saying, yeah, I'm just going to keep blowing past the everybody because I've got, I've got ratios locked down, I think it's early enough where you can screw it up by overplaying volume. I think it is possible. So I'm not in full on like huddle around the ball, take a knee sort of mode with the ratios, <laughs> but I'm not totally willy nilly about it. If I'm winning those categories right now, I think I might have a line for you actually. Yes. So uh, this, this week I was looking at two starters and um, I ended up with a fair amount of Chris Archer. Uh, mm -hmm. He's got, I think Detroit and Cleveland. In Kansas City, uh, and he he's oh, Detroit, we, Kansas City. I was excited about it. I was like, yeah. "This is a good pitcher, good you know against you know two offenses where I like the matchup." I was excited about that. Um, I think you could even pick that up, even if you're protecting your ratios and you wanted to you know get some more K's, right? I think that that that's a pretty good pitcher and pretty good starts, pretty good parks. You know what I mean? Like the other one uh, was Kyle Freeland. Now. I think he's an okay pitcher and I think he's at Pittsburgh. At, I think he's away twice at Washington. Those are decent matchups. I think I would not pick up Kyle Freeland if I was protecting ratios. Right. If you're protecting ratios, if you're not, if you're just middle, if you're just neutral on ratios, then Freeland was a viable two start option for you this week, yeah, right? I got I got him in a couple of places. So I ended up with a fair amount of Archer, but in places where I wasn't as desperate for K's, I ended up with Ronzi Contreras as a pickup over uh Kyle Freeland because I just figured he's a I don't know when he's starting and that's not great in a given week, but 
I like him better as a pitcher, and I'd rather have him long term. The other name that comes up, I, I built this spreadsheet yesterday, just tinkering with the stuff, location, pitching plus, opponent strikeout rate, um, just and, and opponent WRC plus to try and help navigate the pile of pitchers that were out there. Because it in most of my leagues, 15 team mixed leagues and deeper, it's gross every single week. There, there's maybe two or three pitchers you actually like. You get a, a Rowanzi Contreras, you get a Brady Singer, you get someone like that, you look at and say, yeah, something might be different, or this situation's good, this this guy's skills are actually pretty good. So you push for those guys, and everybody else is just sort of not hurting yourself, or like, which temporary option will be just good enough. Jordan Lyles popped up in a few of my leagues. He was at the Yankees and at the Red Sox for his two matchups. And that, that, to me, was... Uh, below the Archer line, even though Chris Archer, I think, has some some in-start workload restrictions that are going to make it very difficult for him to get maybe even more than one win in any given two-start week. Yeah. Uh, it could be folly. I mean, it's there's there's traps, you know, all the time. And Archer, for example, is maybe a four-inning pitcher. That's yeah. what he's been pretty much every start. It's 18 batters faced or less. And because there's probably a one starter out there that might pitch more innings. Than him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe. But good luck. Find, good luck right. guessing on that one. Is, is it yeah, Aaron Savale against the Tigers? Like, right. It could be. But Go ahead. Take that chance. See, right. see how that one works out for you. So, I mean, I, I do think with Archer, the problem is that the location is still not great, right? It's, below average command and then think you need to have and two pitches you need to be really efficient if you're going to only go through the lineup twice and get through five innings to be eligible for a win i mean it would change so much for archer if the twins would just throw an opener in front of him if they threw an opener in front of him he'd go from constantly available in deep mix leagues to someone that people would actually want to have on their rosters even with some of the ratio risk that he carries yeah yeah it's something that's reflected in Pitching Plus. If you're in the document, um, it's very interesting to uh, see these guys. Archer kind of illustrates a thing, which is uh, he's got a 115 stuff plus, 98 command plus, and a 99.4 pitching plus. You'd think those things wouldn't add up the same way. but uh, And this was a, a decision we made when we made the model. Uh, we decided stuff plus would not uh, consider platoon splits. I'm not sure that's the right decision. I, I, it's still something I debate. However, if you use the whole suite of all three and Archer is at 400 pitches, so now all three numbers have become stable, uh, you can see that uh, Pitching Plus does consider platoon splits on, on shapes of pitches. So it's saying, yes, Chris Archer has a good fastball slider. However, he's going to be platoon risky and he doesn't have good command. Therefore, he's a basically an average pitcher. Um, so, you know, and right next to him, this is really interesting. Tyler Anderson has an 89 stuff plus a one Oh five, uh, location plus and virtually the same pitching plus. Mm -hmm. It's different Anderson ways to get there. Lots of different pitches. Doesn't have the platoon risk, has a command, has lower stuff. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to be successful in, in pitching. And I don't even think this model captures all of them, of course, but, uh, uh, you know, it is interesting to put those guys up against each other. And I've started sorting. If you're in the Google Doc, I've started sorting by pitching plus among all the pitchers that have at least uh, 300 pitches thrown. Oh, you know who else bothers me right now? Since we're on the the ratio train and, and pitchers that are just frustrating, Drew Smiley, whose mm. stuff and location and pitching plus numbers are pretty similar to Anderson's. I think just a tick better. He was a two star guy this week, and it was at the Reds. And at oh. the White Sox. And I've had Smiley on rosters more I said than no I would to like that. to admit. I you said, said no. no. Did I, you you bought? I've, I've nudged him in in a few leagues where I either had him <laughs> or I went at it. And it was that at Reds one I didn't like. Because he, he can, he, yeah, he's got the home run possibility. He has the home run problem. Like that yeah. is that is the, the main <laughs> issue. And what I was looking at again, I was looking at K percentages versus lefties and WRC plus versus lefties. And I, I know that can still be pretty noisy because even through 40 games, how many lefties have teams seen? Can we really say that a team is very good or very And he's bad a really lefties? weird lefty too. Like he's a over the top, no wiggle, you know, that's, there's not many lefties like him. 
Yeah, the Reds, though, have been atrocious against lefties so far. I realize they've had a lot of guys oh. missing, so that's part of it. And I think that was enough to nudge him in. All right. White All Sox right. are good against lefties, so the matchup sort of even out that way. But that was that was the last little bit of information I saw. Like, wow, a 68 WRC plus against I'm, lefties. I'm watching Smiley because I, I was like, I can't risk it. I took Kyle Freeland over Drew Smiley. So, Well, and if you gave me the choice between Tyler Anderson and Drew Smiley, I'll give up a little bit in the model and take Anderson given the matchups at the Nats and at the D-backs, especially much easier environments with the Nats. We're not talking about I think he must have been yet. owned. I didn't see him available. He was, he was more rostered, but yeah. I think Anderson was already... He was probably the guy that you're looking at at the bottom of your roster. You're like, yeah, two-star guy, pretty good. Drew Smiley, okay, yeah, I could pick him up. And if you only use one, it's Anderson for me, even though they look really similar on paper. Yeah, I'm, I have an interesting situation in AL Labor where nobody wants to trade with me because I'm a way out in front. Um, and I have a, a roster management situation where I've got surplus and I want to overpay. I want to, I really want to like two for one because I've, I've got just too much, too many players. And nobody wants to do it because they see me coming a mile away. Uh, Two-for-ones are not the greatest thing in in, in fantasy. So it, the, 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 the managing that roster surplus is difficult. And, and I, the way that I was trying to explain it to my brother-in-law, and he said, uh, especially because in certain times you can see a roster crunch happening in, in real time and other, and the other guys can see it too. They're like, Oh, you're about to get Kyle Lewis and jo and you're getting Josh Naylor off the IL this week. You are stuck and you're coming to me and trying to do a two for one. I know what you, I know I can see you coming a mile away. Let me give you this poo poo and this pee pee and we're done. Thank you. Give me your good players. Um, and uh, so my brother in law is like, Oh, so right now you're stuck between choosing between a bad deal now and a worse deal later. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yes, that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes the the answer is to just do nothing in those cases, even though you. Which is what I chose to do this week. I have I have Matt Duffy at middle infield right now, <laughs> yeah. choosing to do nothing <laughs> for one week. That uh, that won't completely burn you, but yeah, I I'm finding the balance in mono leagues, especially, is really difficult to strike via trade. If you're desperate for something you're usually going to lose value overall getting someone to agree to a deal just because they have they have less incentive to deal than you do and the specific needs just don't line up very often so that is something i found to be and really every difficult. time you're like yo you could drop that player i could give you these two players and you could drop that player i'm looking at the player they look at that player and go oh but he could be good <laughs> Just they, give him another week or two. They stashed him for a reason. Especially I like in that a guy for a really, reason. I really, him really deep league. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that, that, those leagues, I, I almost think the mono league is the most dangerous league to fall in love with a player in because the reason to cut a player is basically that the player is no longer on a roster. You have mm -hmm. to be so amazingly bad to be droppable. I have met competitive <laughs> I mono league. I, mean, I like him, but like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I missed out on Ruggiero Door, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah, missed out. That's 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 what you did. You missed out. <laughs> but I, I, it is something that comes up in chats, and it's something that I think people should need to do more of when they're when they're trying to make a trade is to really put yourself in the other person's shoes mm -hmm. and uh, just try to imagine you running their team and what you would see them as needing. And, and and I give a pretty good offer from the beginning. There's nothing worse than starting off with someone and it's just an awful offer from the beginning. And you're just, then you just don't want to do it anymore. You know, you're like, thank you. Move on. Let's get to uh, another question. This is a trade related question that came in from Will. Will writes, sometimes we're thinking about trading in my league. I struggle to nail down the value of a deal that includes pitchers and hitters. Do you have a go-to rule that you use to translate hitter value to pitcher value or vice versa? I was just offered Dylan Carlson for my Taylor Rogers, and my immediate reaction is no way because I'm not very high on Carlson, but I don't truly know how the value of those two players compares. I love the show. Keep up the good work. Um, I think Will's instincts in this particular instance were right. And then we learned on Monday morning, Dylan Carlson just went on the injured list. So that would have nixed it anyway. But I would say that this is kind of one of those things where much like I was saying with steals, where they're almost more valuable than they were on draft day right now. Saves, I think are especially true. Like if, if Taylor Rogers was a 
$18 closer on draft day. He's pitched really well, so he's up a couple of bucks based on that. The health the looks league, good. Health he's looks good. not any risk of losing the job right now. Right. And the league as a whole looks like such a mess for saves. It just feels like... Yeah, and all the other options around the him that valued him at 18 have gotten worse. Like, there's, a lot of them have gotten worse. Right. So you could arguably say that Taylor Rogers in a trade is more like a $25 player right now. Like, that's mm-hmm. what you could reasonably expect back in the return. So you could push... Rogers for the equivalent of a third round bat in a mixed league. I mean, the types of guy like a if it were a mixed league, is Xander Bogarts for Taylor Rogers a ridiculous mm. trade value that that's like imbalanced right now? Listen, that face that I made is mostly just because uh, I don't like trading for saves, <laughs> and this is partially why. Because I agree with you in terms of how the market works, and um, in terms of uh, like our general conversational valuation. I would just never do that. <laughs> There's no way I'm giving you Xander Williams for Tyler Rogers. However, I, I, I guess I could see it. The more, the deeper the league gets, the more it's like, Oh, one closer could make a difference. Like if yeah. I, if I had zero closers in an AL only league and you could give me Tyler Rogers, it wouldn't, I mean, it, it wouldn't work unless you it was like before the trade. And I know, I know, but like, let's say you could give me um, uh, Jordan Romano. For Xander Bogarts in an AL only. I mean, I could see it maybe. If I had zero closers and somehow uh, an MI glut or somebody that could at least reply, or more likely Tyler Rogers and your crappy MI for Xander Bogarts and my, you know, guy I picked up, JP Fireisen. Right. Either way, the, the point is, is just you can look at. You can look at a combination of rest of season value and then standings Jackson, gain points and kind of get a feel for it and say, hey, actually, steel can... saves. I'm going to bump it up a couple of bucks, and I don't think you're going to get turned down by everybody. I think you're going to find that there are people willing to make that move because they know the impact. I think you can also feel your way to it uh, more intuitively by just thinking about um, top ten at their position. So. If you were just looking at Carlson and Rogers, is Rogers top ten in his position, and is Carl is Carlson top ten in his position? Right, and for outfielders, I guess you stretch it to what top thirty, just, just multiply by three because there's something three like times that. as many. Sure, yeah, but even then, you yeah. know, he, yeah. Carlson fails the test. Right, Rogers, yes, Carlson, no. That's another right. just a good approximation. So, uh, hopefully, that that's helpful. I mean, it, a lot of trades end up working that way because the imbalance that two rosters have is I drafted too much hitting, you drafted too much pitching. We can help each other out. The goal, I go into trades with more of a goal of win-win. Like I, I want to make a good deal with you. That way, both of our teams get better. That way, next time we have got a need, we're going to make a trade. If I burn you in a trade. You might remember that and not want to deal with me next time. It's the so, same as getting awful offers, right? Yeah. You can see those coming a mile away and you're like, oh man, this guy again. <laughs> I hopefully I hopefully nobody's listening. It's like you're that guy. I don't think I am. I, I really do try to like have better offers. People, yeah, people think you are that guy. I doubt it, but maybe. <laughs> Somebody listening, devil's rejects. Hit yeah. hit hit up the group chat. <laughs> Tell me how wrong I am. Thanks a no, lot please. for uh, that question, <laughs> Will. Yeah, don't don't shatter Eno's confidence uh, at this point. Uh, I've got an email here from Jack, and it's a question about Tommy Edmond. And he was looking at Tommy Edmond versus Ozzy Albie. He's looking at their projected game power and raw power based on the fan graphs, scouting reports, uh, career walk rates, career strikeout rates exit velocity numbers, barrel rates, and there are a lot of similarities between Tommy Edmond and Ozzy Albies. The key difference, if you look back at like a three-year comparison going back to 2019 now, is you see twice as many home runs from Albies. And part of the reason is that Tommy Edmond hits the ball on the ground more. Maybe the other part of the reason is the park is a more difficult place to hit. That doesn't, I mean, that's not all of the difference. That's just partially the difference. So the gist of the question is, what do you make of Tommy Edmond? Is he a tweak away from being even more like Ozzy Albies, maybe closing the gap on the power? Because Edmond was one of those players that back during draft season, it seemed like more people were out at his price than in. Like he was a, a kind of a consensus. He's fine, but 
I'm going to take someone else instead. Or, yeah, he's going to be in the bottom third of the order, so I'm not interested. And now, I mean, Carlson's hurt, but even before that, things had flipped. Edmund was back in that more prominent spot in the lineup, and he's had a great start to the season through the first 40-plus games. So curious what you think about the comparison that Jack made and if you do think Tommy Edmund might have one more level. Yeah, I, I don't know that he does. I don't know that he does. I mean, he, he has pushed his barrel rate to the top. And one of the reasons why this comparison works is a little bit of recency bias where Albies' barrel rate is one of his worst and Edmund's one of his best. I think if you kind of look, if you like if you looked at it going into the season, uh, you would have a different sense of their barrel rates because Albies has had 9% barrel rates in 2020 and 2021. Uh, whereas Edmund was uh, more in the 4%, right? So we're talking about a guy who hits twice as many barrels. Now you add in, he he plays in Atlanta, which is conducive to homers, and Edmund plays in a park that actually reduces homers more than almost any other park in baseball. I think it's like second or third worst. So I don't, I just don't. I, and then my last thing that I wanted to add is that Edmund is 27 years old and has played uh 1400 plate appearances in the big league so i think we have a a decent sense of of where he is maybe this year he'll hit 15 homers uh because he has one of the best barrel rates and maybe this year albies uh who is showing one of his worst barrel rates will only hit 22 or something um 24 it might be one of the closest they've been i just don't think they're actually that comparable in, in terms of power yeah I mean, the I'm barrel rates are pretty different blown away that uh, tommy edmund has a 140 wrc plus that is not something i saw coming i realized yeah it's only a quarter of a season um 10 for 11 is a base stealer i mean I if was... we're talking about which one's the better like if there are if they're comparable hitters in real life then actually i think they're way closer than people think yes they you know yeah you might even prefer edmund well, Especially with the way that he's he's taking walks. Yeah, that's the thing. The walk rate is way up right now. I'm wondering if the if the hard hit rate between the two players is actually going to end up being closer than expected, too. I mean, Tommy Edmonds got a 35.3% hard hit rate. Why? Ozzie Elby's 33.7 over the last uh, three seasons combined. So, Oh, I, yeah. Okay. I was just looking. This year's Albies at 24%. That's pretty awful. I can't yeah. believe he's even still has a 5% barrel rate. He's, I mean, he, one thing that he does is when he hits the ball hard, it's in the air. I mean, that's, that's what I see when I look because he's getting a lot out of a smaller hard hit rate than Edmund. And then Edmund, when he hits it hard, he hits on the ground. Uh, so that's, that's part of, that's part of the story here. Uh, yeah. And over the, the course of the last three years, Albies just swings more. He swings more pitches in the zone. He swings more pitches outside the zone. Um, Edmund makes more contact in the zone. So they, I don't know. There's just some pretty interesting things here in these profiles where I think more people than not really like Elby's because of his age, the lineup he's in. There's plenty to like there. But I don't I think, think there were a lot of questions about his ADP, but there were a lot of questions about where Edmund was going. I think the best news about this Edmund barrel rate, the where it is right now, is that it pulls him out of the Whit Merrifield territory. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not, this is not a guy who's going to have a 0.90 ISO anytime soon. In 2020, you might have thought so because he had a 0.118 ISO and a 3% barrel rate. Like you might, th- you might have been like, this is Whit Merrifield all over again. Like, right? That's what I thought. Yeah, I thought Edmund guy was a old. younger Whit Merrifield. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think he's pulled himself out of that. I mean, a 4% barrel rate the next year and a 7% barrel rate this year with a, with a, an increase in raw power as judged by maximum uh, exit velocity, uh, keeping his swing strike rate low at the same time. Like I think he's uh, pulled himself out of that. I would, I would consider him uh, as a, a better bet to age uh, gracefully into his early thirties, more than what Merrifield is going for. It's a lot for that question, Jack. We had a follow-up email come in from Ani and she pointed out that uh, Joey Votto is actually using a new style bat throughout spring training and into April. There's mm-hmm. a story that C. Trent Rosecrans wrote for The Athletic. I completely missed it. It was the the hockey puck knob bat. And yeah. he ditched it just before landing on the COVID IL for two weeks, which is pretty interesting. So Ani broke it down into, into three parts. She's like, Votto part one, new bat, 30% K rate, 
Votto part two, sick with COVID for a couple of weeks. Votto part three, the start of his 40 home run season. I mean, <laughs> he said he still got plenty of time to lead the league in 39 in left. Rates. 39 <laughs> to go. But I didn't realize he was in a different bat. And I'm, I'm just surprised that he was even messing with that at this stage of his career, coming off the season that he just but had. That's, that's who he is. He's a crazy person. Constant tinker. Yeah, I mean, he's always he's always like he's trying to set up uh, pitchers by doing one thing early in the season and doing something completely different the second part of the season. He's he's admitted as much to me, um, you know, so he, he, he you know, he's he, yeah, I, I think that just makes him really hard to analyze. You know, it's a, just he had another example of why uh, I know his numbers don't look good. He's chasing more than he's ever chased. Uh, the barrel rate is way down from the last, uh, where it's been the last two seasons. Uh, you know, there's a lot, the K rate is just astronomical. The swing strike rate is astronomical. All these things are somewhat meaningful in smaller samples. So like, yeah, I get it. Except it's, it's Joey Votto. You know? <laughs> like, he could wake up tomorrow and decide not to swing at a single pitch outside the zone. There's a thing he could he could do, but um, are you interested? We're available. I mean, there's some 10 and 12 team leagues where, of course, he's hit the wire. There's leagues where you could trade for him right now, and he'd be he'd fit really well on the, the NL labor disaster squad because he's an performer right now. I held him through uh, in those 12 team leagues. I, I actually in most of my leagues, I held him. I held him through this, uh, and I'm going to give him like the next two weeks before uh, I turf him, but. Uh, He's also sometimes in those 15 team leagues, you know, there's not much uh, that uh, there to replace him. Um, but what I have tried to do is in the meantime, especially since he's hurt, I've been trying to like audition guys that could replace him. Right. So at some point I may just decide, uh, you know, one of these other guys that I picked up in the meantime is better than him. I might have an example for, it. I mean, Rowdy Telez was an example, right? Um, and at this point, yes, I would, I think I have Rowdy ahead of, uh, Votto, but there's always CI, right? So then you're like, okay, who's, who, who's, who's, uh, my guy in CI. Um, uh, and then it's like, well, I'd rather keep Votto just in case. So let me see where I have Votto. It's not in TGFBI. Uh, I hope he becomes available in some of my leagues. I don't. I don't think it's going to happen, but if he does, I'm, I'm interested. Let's see. This might be a Votto team. Uh, oh, my main might be a Votto team. Yes. So my main is a Votto team. In the meantime, while he was out, um, I picked up Juan Yepes, uh, Michael Chavis, and uh, I have Nate Lowe. So... I'm keeping yeah. Votto, right? You keep Votto, yeah, you're probably keeping Votto. <laughs> Chavis did kind of stand out to me this weekend when I was digging around looking for depth bats, though, because he's he's doing a few things better than he has in the past. We know that there are multiple spots in that lineup right now in Pittsburgh that are you know, revolving doors. So if he hits, he'll play, and he's been playing pretty consistently. And Chavis was kind of an all-bat sort of profile not that long ago. K rate's down so far, under 25% this season, easily the best that it's been during his time in the big leagues. He's always been a decent barreler, even as a part-time yeah. player, right? His career is like 8.4%. He's at 7.6 right now. So uh, I would look at He's that. chasing and... a little bit more than I'd like, but, you know, decent barrel rate again. I, I've, yeah, I picked him up in a couple places also because he's M-I-C-I, first yeah. base, second base. So he can cover a lot. He can cover like three or four positions from a bench spot. And, yeah, I think the number one thing for me has actually been usage. Like, he's playing a fair amount, you know, and he's playing, I think, against lefties, it must be. He's third in the order. And against righties, sixth in the order, but that's good enough. I mean, that's better than being out of the order against uh, against righties. So, um, I'm I'm definitely watching Michael Chavis, and I think you know over the next two weeks, uh, it could become a situation where if if low starts getting going, because you know Donnie Ecker is doing his work in Texas. It's just taking a little while longer. They had a three week spring, right? And so what you saw with uh, with Cole Calhoun the last couple of weeks. Cole Calhoun, about two weeks into the season, uh, changed the way he stood at the plate. Like he brought his feet closer together. Then he had like a two-week stretch where he hit five homers, right? Yeah, he went 
pretty wild and popped up on the wire and probably got scooped up this weekend anywhere he was available. And I was so annoyed because uh, Donnie told me about this adjustment that he'd made with Cole Calhoun right after I dropped Cole Calhoun in like the two or three places. So I was a little annoyed. Uh, but uh, I kind of, I, I, and I think Lowe was doing so well at the beginning where, you know, it didn't feel like maybe uh, there was uh, that urgency that, that Cal Cole Calhoun had, you know, to, to figure something out. Uh, but Cole, uh, Lowe has really taken a, a step back and has really been struggling. So I'm hoping there's an adjustment there for him um, that they're working on that, that'll come through. But uh, this week, I think Lowe's on the bench and Chavis is in. And, um, you know, I guess if Lowe does turn something around and Votto doesn't, uh, I guess I could have some uh, lineups where it's uh, Chavis and, and Lowe and Yepes and, uh, and Votto's on the bench. So. You know, uh, I had to nurse him through this I, in 12 team leagues. I could see, you know, my 12 team dynasty league. I, I, if I didn't have a lot of IL slots, I could have seen dropping him. Um, I was using belt and Telez uh, while he was out. And uh, so I just actually just swapped belt and Votto on the IL and we'll just keep it going. But if you didn't have that IL ability, I could see dropping him. I understand. I, but I, I, I keep a little place warm in my heart for Joey Votto. Compared to so many of the other corner bats that you're trying to wish cast to a more prominent role or to more consistent production, I feel like you're not wishing as much on Votto. It's a little easier to talk it's yourself. like a long ass track talking. record. Yeah. <laughs> right. Michael Chavis, you're like, dude, don't go back to striking out a third of the time. And right. you, know, you don't really draw walks. So please draw and walks. I can and see that 40% reach rate, that 40% chase rate. So I, I could come anytime. Yeah. But thanks a lot for that email, Ani. Let's get to a question about Gary Sanchez. Has anything changed? I think it was an email from John. Um, if you look at the profile, I mean, at a glance to me, this looks an awful lot like typical Gary Sanchez. And part of the problem with Gary Sanchez is that when you strike out nearly 30% of the time and you don't run particularly well, you're going to have a low average. He doesn't walk a ton year over year, at least he's not walking this year. So the OBP is down right now. I think the walk rate could still creep up a little bit. So I'm not looking at the walk rate being down and saying that's changed for the worst and that's who he is going forward. Uh, I just feel like his his margin for, for error in the batting average category is just really slim because the type of player that he is and everything looks really similar to me than it has in the past, even though he's playing pretty well right now. Yeah, I think the in some ways it's, he's doing the, um, you know, if you don't have great bat to ball skills, then sometimes being more aggressive can be useful uh, because you get to that fastball before you strike out. Um, so he is being more aggressive right now. Swing rate is up um, and uh, it's mostly on zone swing. So that's been, that's, it's been aggressive in the zone is, is what he's been. And uh, I think it's, I think it's doing him well. The 56% fly ball rate says to me that the, uh, his batting average is being, attacked from both sides it's being attacked by the strikeout rate but it's also being attacked by his launch angle and uh you know i think once you get over 50 percent fly ball rate you start having pop-ups you start uh having really low babips and that's something um that uh, applies to sanchez career 253 babip career uh 43 fly ball rate career 27 percent strikeout rate so that's all those reasons he has a career 229 batting average i don't think there's much more that can go right for him. Uh, I think this is who he is. Um, and uh, I think in some cases, it was just like, hey, let's not uh, continue to batter him for who he, who he isn't. You know, let's just uh, take this guy and appreciate him for who he is. Yeah, and I think that's happening a little more now that he's got the fresh start in Minnesota. My question for you, where do you think Gary Sanchez ranks in the auction calculator? Rest of season for the bat X? among catchers uh you know because uh, i i think they did an adjustment to the run value uh the, the run environment in the bat x so i would guess that league average batting average projected forward for uh for most people is like a 230 so his 215 average probably wouldn't hurt as bad um as it would seem and so i'm gonna guess like uh top five top four 
He's seventh. I mean, it's okay. it's it's Will Smith, Dalton Varsho, Wilson Contreras, JT Real Muto. How about that? Dalton Varsho at number two. Oh, Real Muto's falling off. Sal Perez and then Yasmani Grandal before you get to Sanchez. But that's if there still, were still good. That's really I'm good. Happy, eh? happy in my in my uh, draft champions leagues. I've got a couple of Sanchez. Yeah, more Sanchez. playing time than a lot of other guys that get kind of stuck behind him at the position. If the league as a whole Maybe is going to hit for a average, lower average. Hurt is bad because the, everyone else, yeah, exactly what you were just saying. The context is better. And then the team, the team is better, right? So your runs and RBIs, not, not compared to where he was last year with the Yankees, but just compared to other catchers in the pool, the Twins, I think, yeah. have an above average offense. That bodes well for the counting stats as well. And that's huge when you're talking about a difference in playing time and a difference in lineup quality. So not a lot has changed, but just a, a, awesome. a good player that's just, getting to be himself, I think, in Minnesota. It's become rarer just to be able to hit home runs. <laughs> I am I am interested to see how this transitions into the summer months, though. And that was our next question. This question came in from the Jerry. <laughs> I don't know what that's from. But the, uh, the question from Jerry two pods ago, you know, mentioned looking at home run rate outliers with good K minus B percentages as good targets. That got me wondering, don't home run rates typically increase as we move into the summer? Or is this a thing of the past with the new ball and humidors? So I think based on what you wrote along with Ken Rosenthal a few weeks ago, I think if I remember correctly, the guidance there was the run environment could actually change a lot because the humidor is going to make the ball react a lot differently when we get to the consistent 80 plus degree days with high levels of humidity around the league. So what is a sluggish power environment now could swing considerably once the weather has warmed up all over. Yeah, and I doubt myself more with every day um however we have started to see some uh, nine to eights and and ten to yeah i think we've seen some 20 run games and stuff so i i think that there is there has been a tick up in the run environment and the the theory i think is still sound which is just that you know in the early drier months uh the humidor because the humidor is just set to one level the humidor will actually be adding water and then in the later wetter months, it would be taking water out relative to last year. And so if you took water out of an August ball last year, then you should increase the uh, the distance that it goes. So uh, then there's the, just the natural uh, trend. Um, you know, the ball has been a big deal in the last few years. Uh, but this is interesting because this is uh, this was put together by Patrick Brennan. Um, who uh, he does good stuff. What who what is he on Twitter? Got to give him the right love here. Painting corners or something. Yeah. You know, painting looks for corner. A, you know, looks for a Twitter handle should be on the rates and barrels. <laughs> anyway, he's a, with baseball ops with the Phillies now, but he used to write for Beyond the Box Score, RIP. And uh, he had this great piece where he just looked at the home run for fly ball. Right. He also looks temperature. Temperature peaks in July uh, the, and and August. But the June, July, August, those are the the peak uh, year, the peak times for for temperature. Some of the places, other, like for example, San Antonio peaks in July. I don't know why that's on uh, the list for for baseball, but uh, uh, other places peak in August. So. Uh, if you look at league wide home runs, home runs per fly ball by month, which uh, Patrick did, and he did it from 2002 to 2019. So it only has one juice ball year in it. Right. Um, and, and we might be out of the juice ball era again. So this is relevant to us. April home runs per fly ball is 10.5 percent. May is 10.7. June is 11. July is 11. August is 11.3. And September is 10.8. So we're just now getting into peak home runs per fly ball uh, territory. And then you may have this aspect of the humidor pulling water out of the balls. So we may just have, uh, in, the, in the interest of consistency, uh, created a more inconsistent month-to-month -month situation in baseball where maybe our Aprils will just be down big and our Augusts will be up big. So that that that's still a possibility. That's something I wrote about when I wrote about on Friday, um, you know, hitters that are adjusting to this new ball and hitting more fly balls. 
I am hitting more line drives instead of fly balls. Uh, I hope they made the right decision. We'll see in August. I was going to ask if there's any way to possibly leverage this. Are you looking for pitchers who have shown significant improvement in home run rate to this point in the season and saying, you know no, what? No, 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 no. That's These are the players that I'm no, looking to get rid of. These trouble. are the guys I'm looking to trade away. Oh, 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 I see. You were saying a different way to, to, to trade away guys who had real low home run rate so far. Yeah, get away from the players that have moved the most. I and mean, there's already a lot of noise in home run rate over a that's what, yeah. Stretch I, thought anyway. you were, I thought you were saying like target pitchers that have improved in their home run rate. Yes, I wouldn't do that because there's so much noise in home run rate, as you said, normally. And then you add to that noise with this humidor situation. So, yes, I, I would. But I, I think uh, another interesting question. So I do think uh, I'm in trouble a little bit by not being behind in K's because I think that the two start streaming strategy is going to get a lot harder because <laughs> you're going to be taking these fringe guys and now you're going to be throwing them in August and being like, uh, oh, you know, Smiley in Cincinnati in, in July or whatever. You know, <laughs> then you're gonna be like, oops, <laughs> there's three homers, five runs, three innings. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, so I, I think that like an aggressive April streaming strategy may become more uh, viable, uh, with if the humidor is going to change the shape of the season, like what if in the future, uh, home runs per fly ball rate are 10% in April, but still 11.5 in August. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If it just kind of became more stratified, uh, then you would want to react to that by being more aggressive with streaming early, get ahead in K's uh, and then kind of protect uh, prote like sort of work on your ratios after that by being uh, having more relievers in your lineup and such, uh, that sort of deal. Um, and then the other thing uh, that, I, that I think is interesting to me is, you know, if we start to see this like crazy July thing, would you love to trade a guy who has, uh, you know, a great strikeout rate? And let me see if I can come up with a guy. But let's say, would you like to, to uh, trade a guy who's a great strikeout rate, but right now uh, is maybe getting lucky on on home runs? for someone who has a great ground ball rate like right now you know what i mean so um let's see somebody who's been getting lucky on home runs maybe uh scooble Verlander. um i i did by k minus bb scooble oh compared to his previous compared home to previous rates? norms right like there could be see like the, with scooble i can tell myself yes there's probably some skills improvement he's changing his pitches he's doing things differently but he's not going from a two homers per nine guy to a 0. 0.4 homers per nine guy. That's probably not a new baseline. Oh, I was looking in the wrong category. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Gossman. Gallon. 0.18. It's that Gallon. Pretty big improvement from him. He was at 1.41 homers per nine last year. He's at 0. 0.239 homers per nine so far this oh, season. Oh, I've got the perfect name. Carlos Carrasco. Yep, he pops on this list. 0. 0.58 homers per nine. Dude, if you could trade him for some of that now, the, the harder part is finding a good uh, pitcher with ground ball rate. But if you could trade, I mean, could you trade Carrasco for Fromber? Maybe not. But... Probably not getting away with that. But you could just yeah. trade You could just trade Carrasco for a bat and just find yeah. someone that needs pitching, get a and bat, then and then flip Fromber. a bat for a different pitcher. Here are uh, some, I think, some names that are actually kind of interesting. Brad Keller, um, I've found, I've used him a lot in streaming. 51% ground ball rate is sixth among qualified pitchers. Um, nice. So I think that's an interesting name to remember. Uh, Adam Wainwright. You know, maybe he's just attainable because he's old, you know. Um, Kyle Gibson, 50% ground ball rate. So I mean, they, these some of these names have, have been like pitching pretty well, but they could still be attainable. Miles Michaelis, 47% ground ball rate. Now, once you drop a low 50 it's uh, less meaningful. You do want the over 50, but there's some guys there and it might be, they might be more useful uh, when it comes to uh, July. <laughs> you know, they might, they might suddenly be somebody that you'd be more interested in. Um, Graham Ashcraft didn't do well uh, by uh, the stuff model, uh, but did get 7% uh, ground balls in his first uh his first start. Alex Cobb, I think, is about to go on a run. If you want to buy low pitcher, Alex Cobb is my guy. 
well, I, I do need a buy low pitcher in a few leagues, so perhaps I will follow your advice and, and go after Cobb. I mean, the situation, of course, in San Francisco, I just like that floor so much. Same with Alex Wood. I don't have any specific reason for targeting Alex Wood. I just have him already in a league where I think the velo is up. I think better. He, yeah, the velo is up. He's actually made a couple changes to uh, the fastball, the, the shapes in his pitches, and I think both of those guys are about to go on a run. I would love to see it for very selfish reasons. Thanks a lot for that question, Jerry. Uh, one more question to get to. Ooh. Uh, no, it's too late, maybe. But Michael Lorenzen, 56 ground ball rate, and he lowered his arm slot and told me he had a couple uh, different cues to to improve his, uh, his sinker. So he has a really good sinker right now, uh, and uh, he might be a little bit safer. He might be safer, for example, than Thor. Not intuitive, but interesting nonetheless thor's stuff has not come back and he's succeeding on the fact that he's throwing a lot of pitches and has command but uh lorenzen's stuff scores better than thor's and he has the higher ground ball rate so just an idea last question here comes from rob it's actually about ballpark shadows rob was watching a padres braves game just about 10 days ago and it had a four o'clock eastern start time the announcers were talking about how in the early innings, around the fourth and fifth inning, the middle innings, it would start to be a problem to have the, the shadows creeping in. And Rob was curious if there are other parks that have similar issues that come up and uh, if there's any way to take advantage of that because of you know the sun being somewhat predictable. The sun tends to do the things you expect the sun to do. Uh, for me, I, I've noticed this as a Brewers fan at Miller Park. When they get this strange late afternoon start time, and that's I think this happens in a lot of parks for those late afternoon matinees. They catch that national game on the weekend. Anytime that the team doesn't ordinarily play where they have a day game, that's when you're going to probably see some weird things because the stadium wasn't necessarily designed with that game time in mind. It was designed with where's the sun at one o'clock local and what's the where's the sun going to be setting if we're playing a night game. Those are probably the two considerations in, in most ballparks in terms of how they're positioned. So Miller Park gets this really badly late afternoon it's even worse late in the season uh, especially if they're playing playoff games if they have a, a four o'clock central start the sun comes in it's, it's like pitchers in the shadows batters in the sun or vice versa and it does seem like it's a really difficult situation to hit in when that happens yeah 100 percent um i i think of a few things right now i'm developing a piece um that uh i may 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 take all, all season because i'm just talking to people right now just gathering information and opinions but um I, one thing i think of is there are ballpark factors for strikeouts and walks mm -hmm. and like normally i think people think of ballpark factors as like oh yeah how does the ball fly you know but I think that uh, when you start thinking about, oh, yeah, ballparks can augment strikeouts or suppress walks. Why would that be? So then my first thought was the batter's eye, because, you know, I did a piece with Andrew Bagley on here where, um, you know, they don't have paint on the seats in the bleachers in San Francisco. So they've got these metal paintless seats and they would switch to 640 start times on the weekdays. Right. And so people are still getting there from work. And so in the first couple of uh, innings, what you'll find is the sun is coming right over the back of the ballpark and reflecting through those seats and right into the batter's eye. Uh, and so part of the batter's eye, which is the, the place behind the pitcher where you're trying to keep, you know, pick up the location, part of that is sun reflecting back at you. Not so uh, that that led Justin Upton to tell me that it was the worst place to hit. And it was because of the batter's eye and the and the, the sun reflecting. But then I talked to um, uh, Stephen Biscotti and something something I'd never heard before, which is that uh, the batter's eyes were pretty were fine from place to place. But what he really didn't like was when the ball was lit up a certain way, like the ball itself. Mm -hmm. And so he seemed to not like um, domes. Because he said, what I really don't like, if I can, if I look at the pitcher and his face is in shadow, I don't like that. Because what that means is the ball, I'm only going to see the top half of the ball in light and the bottom half of the ball is going to be in shadow. And it just leads, makes it hard to determine the spin or determine the location or just pick it up. It's just, it's the ball is lit weirdly. 
Um, and that's true. Uh, that might ring true for people uh, who watch games in the trop. The trop uh, has, I think, this sort of straight down lighting. And, you know, Willie Damas said that he had a really hard time uh, in the trop and it was the LED lights they put in place. So, you know, I thought of that as like somehow reflecting off the batter's eye. I was always thinking batter's eye. Now I'm thinking, oh, it's it's actually the nature of the lighting. So that becomes even more uh, granular than our this great letter, right? This great, great email we've gotten where he's talking about like literally the shadows, like you, you're talking about the shadows across between the pitcher and the hitter. But that means that there's other times of the day when the sun is just hitting maybe straight down, maybe these 11 or 12 o'clock starts where some batters don't like that either, you know, because the ball is lit up weird. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is you may have a hard time proving this statistically because every hitter has their own thing they hate or love in terms of lighting, batter's eyes, et cetera. Uh, but we did find uh, a distinct home field advantage for San Francisco in the early innings mm. that uh, they uh, their opponents scored less than most opponents do in the beginning of a game. It's pretty interesting. The um, the thought I had with Adames is that you, you have the roof at Miller Park or American Family Field. It's, it's closed a lot this time of year and now that you get to memorial day the weather's oh and he hadn't seen that because he got traded he got yeah. traded into the about warm a, about weather. a year ago so he, the roof was pretty much open i mean unless it was raining it was probably open more than it was closed by the time he got there and i was looking to see like, okay beginning of this season how are his splits at home he's got five of his nine home runs at home and it's only 14 out of 35 games played there but he is hitting That's 192 strikeout rate. Strike strike rate's rate. a little higher yeah. yeah 18 k's and 62 plate appearances so Interesting Maybe you'll have that it's a different. good second half when the when he's get that sunlighting. Mm-hmm. I just think this is a, it. It does go back to statistical issues that you're pointing to, where it's like it's such a small number of plate appearances. Is it meaningful? Is it predictive? It's going to be hard to say that it is, but it also seems like it couldn't possibly be nothing because seeing the ball seems pretty important in the process of hitting the ball. Yeah, and I talked to Brett Phillips about clutch um, and. I think that sometimes um, we have this uh, feeling of like, oh, clutch doesn't exist because we haven't been able to prove it. We haven't been able to show it, right? We have no predictive stat of clutchness. So therefore, clutch doesn't exist. But Brett Phyllis is like, no, man, it's like, I'm sorry, it does exist. And I've had this experience before with, with players. And uh, he was like, you know what you need to do is you need to stick a heart rate monitor on us. And mm-hmm. and let us go out there, and you'll sh- you'll see. Some people have a, a slow heart rate, and some people have a high heart rate. And I was like, well, what about this idea that everybody who's made the major leagues has already we've already we've already sort of sorted through you. You guys are all clutch. Anybody who's made the major leagues, mm-hmm. and he said, I don't know if that's true, man, because in my first year when I first got up, my heart was racing. There were times where I, I didn't even see the pitch. And there was the pitch was past me because I was just so in my feelings. Basically, I was just so <laughs> like, ah, you know, and he said, <laughs> you know, being traded to Tampa, I'm living at home. This is my hometown. Somebody wanted me. They told me they wanted me. They made me feel at home and I had some early success. It's 100 percent different now when I step to the plate in terms of what my heart is feeling. And I, I'm sorry, I think if you looked at the MVPs, that's what he's saying. If you looked at the MVPs, uh, if you looked at the the people who do best in the clutch, you would find a lot of really slow heartbeats. Right. But see, that's where I think how you would measure clutch would be more about how you feel in a situation. The logical aspects. And less about the results. statistical results. But I feel like in the past, it was always a statistical thing where it's like, oh, runners in scoring position or uh, in October, this player does this. Like those those things, which, again, are small you've samples. Cut, you've cut it down. You've cut it down too much. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you want to look at just how does a player actually physically respond to those situations? Does that make that player more or less likely to be successful? In any I think it's spot. actually sort of wild that it doesn't like we've we, we statistically have come up with this idea of clutch uh, like there's a, actually a clutch stat and you can look and what it basically says is how, do they perform better in high leverage situations like we've defined a pretty good stat that's just not predictive and 
you know, it's kind of amazing that it's not because I, we designed a pretty good stat to like try to capture this. Um, but, but I, you know, I think also, um, you know, seasons are small samples sometimes too. You can have a whole season of clutch opportunities and maybe you got divorced that year. Maybe you had a baby that year, you know, like maybe, maybe you, maybe you were pressing, you signed a big contract and you were pressing that year and you were just, you were doing whatever you could to, 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 to prove that the contract was good. And then the next year you calm down, you know, and then you'd have terrible clutch numbers one year and great clutch numbers next year. Maybe if we were able to put a heart monitor on you, we would have noticed that you were stressed out of your eyeballs that one year and, and more comfortable the next year. So, yeah. Or yeah, if you weren't sleeping and we knew you weren't sleeping, maybe that's why you weren't clutch because you were <clears> struggling. <throat> you were struggling right. to stay awake. You were not as focused as you possibly could be because of, of that i mean we will have more of that study i think as we go forward because the i i was like brett you would never like you as a player you would never let the team put that heart rate monitor on he's like i don't know man probably would you know there's a lot of stuff to be learned you know uh from it and more and more teams are doing it in the mo low minors with all sorts of wearable technology so you know they're all the pitchers are wearing the modus sleeve when they do bullpens and stuff like they're you know, they, they know uh, they're, they're wearing technology right now. So what's another one? Way of the future. Looking forward to, uh, to seeing more and more of that tech and, and trying to learn some stuff from it. Hopefully we'll learn something from it someday. But it might be a little ways off before we're actually talking about anything that's remotely publicly and, available. You're right. Yeah, it's a, it's one of those things, too, where it costs the, the technology costs a lot. And then it's there's like an, an arrangement between the player and the team or, or at least, you know, they want it to keep it. At least the team keeps it to themselves and doesn't like send it out to everybody. Right. So I don't think we're going to be getting access. Catapult is, is a thing that you can just wear that gives you all sorts of information about your heart rate and, and sleeping habits. And you can wear the, the, what's that ring, the novice ring or something. There's a ring and, oh, that you can, that can tell you about how you slept. Um, and they're, they're, you know, most te they're teams that are doing all, all that and collecting the data and, and learning. Uh, but I doubt that we'll get it out here for, for, for a while. Thanks a lot for the ballpark shadows question, by the way, Rob. If you got a question for a future episode, you can send it our way, rates and barrels at theathletic.com or drop it in as a comment under this video on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button on this video. You can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. If you don't have a subscription to The Athletic, get one for $1 a month at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Thursday. Oh, it's so good to have you back. Thanks for listening.